بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه تسليما السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته رمضان مبارك to our esteemed audience my name is Zainab Ansari and I'm honored to be an instructor for the year of knowledge program with Jannah Institute and inshallah for this topic we are going to focus on the impact of the Quran on the heart a very appropriate topic given that we are in the month of Ramadan and given that our aspiration is to complete the Quran during this month or engage in an intensive study of this beautiful and noble book so I will offer a few reflections uh, by way of some of what I teach to my students and also for my own teachers regarding uh, the impact of the Quran on the heart and let me preface this reflection um, to our esteemed audience let me preface this reflection by saying that the intention when we read the Quran should be for the Quran to interact with the heart and I want to begin by presenting to everyone just the concept of the heart whether it's qalb or fuad that the heart really is the seat of understanding within the Islamic tradition in fact dear sisters in the Quranic presentation of human existence we are told that the insan the human being is endowed with different faculties or uh, entities so what are these faculties the human being is endowed with the qalb the human being is endowed with the fuad the nafs the ruh and the aql and it's very interesting to actually see how allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, addresses the qalb and the fu'ad in particular in, in the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also makes reference to a category of people called ulul albab. Ulul albab, those people endowed with sound understanding. And what is very, very interesting is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not really refer to the aql as a stand-alone entity in the Qur'an, but instead Allah Ta'ala focuses more on the qalb or the fu'ad, uh, the ruh and the nafs sometimes, and of course this category of people called ulul albab. So what we learn in all cases, my dear sisters, is that the human being must cultivate certain faculties and capabilities. And I will give you an ayah, and I have several ayahs in the presentation I've prepared, but I'm going to give you an ayah right now that you can look up. This is Surah um, uh, 13, so chapter uh, Ar-Ra'd. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this chapter, بَعْدَ أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ أَفَمَنْ يَعْلَمُ أَنَّمَا أُنْزِلَ إِلَيْكَ مِنْ رَبِّكَ الْحَقِّ كَمَنْ هُوَ أَعْمَى so this is again chapter 13, Surah Al-Rad, this is verse 19, and Allah Ta'ala revealed, uh, is the one who knows that your Lord's revelation to you, O Prophet, is the truth, can that one be like the one who is blind? None will be mindful of this except people of reason. So here Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala tells us about the special category of Ulul Al-Bab, who are these people? The people uh, uh, of understanding ulul al-bab are the people that understand the reality of revelation. They understand the truth of that. They understand, my dear sisters, the truth of prophecy. So these are people who are who are endowed with the correct understanding, which is actually through the qalb as opposed to the aql. It might be strange that I say that, because we are told that. Uh, that that uh, the Islamic tradition beautifully brings together uh, reason and revelation, which is absolutely true. But the point I want to emphasize, my dear sisters, is that many a person uh, who is endowed with aql, i.e., with uh, intelligence or with the uh, with 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 rationality, many a person has come to the the Quran, but not necessarily come away being convinced of the truth of the Quran i.e. there are experts in the Qur'an as a text and they study the Qur'an, they study its uh, its vocabulary, they study its history and so on. They study the asbab nuzul, they study even the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa So in other words, they come to the Qur'an to study it as an academic text 
And these are people that are intelligent people, they are educated, but because the heart is not endowed with this understanding, because they are not from Ulul Al-Bab, then they, they're they not able to conclude that the Qur'an is indeed from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they're like the one, even despite their education, they're like the one who is a'ma, they're like the one who is, his, who is blind, as we just saw in the ayah in chapter 13. So the qalb, my dear sisters, is that um, the it is the entity that actually has the greatest degree of sensitivity. And let me just kind of uh, focus on that, and then inshallah I'll come back to what we looked at right, right there. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Qur'an, بَعْدَ أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ أَمْ عَلَى قُلُوبٍ أَقْفَالُهَا Will they, uh, will they not then ponder or meditate on the Qur'an? Or are there locks on the hearts? So we understand from this ayah, my dear sisters, that Allah Ta'ala invites us to engage in a process called tadabbur, which I'll speak more about in a moment. And Allah Ta'ala also tells us that the requisite capability for engaging in tadabbur, the prerequisite really, is to have a heart that is alive, a heart that is uh, attuned to the Qur'an, a heart that is receptive. Therefore, the person that approaches the Qur'an in a very dry academic way, or the person that approaches the Qur'an and uh, they view the Qur'an as some type of uh, historical text, that person, unless Allah Ta'ala changes their heart, is not going to be able to access certain meanings and truths because ala, right? It's like their hearts have been uh, locked away from accessing those meanings and those understandings. And we know, my dear sisters, from ayahs in the Qur'an, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns us about a category of people that uh, they they have diseased hearts. So for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, بَعْدَ أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ إِنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا سَوَاءٌ عَلَيْهِمْ أَأَنذَرْتَهُمْ أَمْ لَمْ تُنذِرْهُمْ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ خَتَمَ اللَّهُ عَلَى قُلُوبِهِمْ وَعَلَى سَمْعِهِمْ وَعَلَى أَبْصَارِهِمْ غِشَاوَةٌ وَلَهُمْ عَذَابٌ عَظِيمٌ وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَقُولُ آمَنَّا بِاللَّهِ وَبِالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَمَا هُمْ بِمُؤْمِنِينَ وَمَا هُمْ بِمُؤْمِنِينَ يُخَادِعُونَ اللَّهَ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَمَا يَخْدَعُونَ إِلَّا أَنفُسَهُمْ وَمَا يَشْعُرُونَ فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ مَرَضٌ فَزَادَهُمُ اللَّهُ مَرَضًا وَلَهُمْ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ وَلَهُمْ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ بِمَا كَانُوا يَكْذِبُونَ So these ayahs are in Al-Baqarah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is uh, revealed these ayahs to inform the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that whether you exert your utmost energy in warning the kuffar, the disbelievers, or you don't warn them, it will, it's the same, they will not believe. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, introduces after that another category of people after the disbelievers those are the munafiqun and they are actually described as people that that there are some there are some from amongst the people that will come to you saying we believe but in fact they do not believe so they have this this outward pronouncement of of, of faith but it has not actually entered the heart and in fact Allah Ta'ala tells us in those ayahs again you can look them up in the beginning of Al-Baqarah this is the second page Allah Ta'ala tells us that fi qulubihim marad fazadahum Allahu marada that they have in their hearts is a disease and God increases them in this disease and then they will have a painful punishment because of the deceit in which they are engaging so taking this, uh, these concepts back to the ayah right here in Surah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam verse 24, we see that Allah Ta'ala is telling us something about a heart that is receptive, a heart that is open to receiving this guidance, and a heart that is closed off, sealed off, locked away, and a heart that is diseased. Now, the next uh, point that I want to make, my dear sisters, is this ayah really, really um, stood out to me when I was reading it. And in this ayah, in Surah Al-Furqan, chapter 25, 
Allah Ta'ala reveals بَعْدَ أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وقال الرسول يا ربي إن قوم اتخذوا هذا القرآن مهجورا and on that day the apostle the messenger will say O oh my sustainer O oh my Lord behold some of my people have come to regard this Quran as something that ought to be cast away discarded i.e. abandoned so what does this ayah mean so what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is revealing to us is that when the hearts of the people really it's two things here number one when the hearts of the people are closed off to this message Allah Ta'ala has sealed their hearts their hearts are locked against this message and those people will uh, sort of uh, sink down in disbelief and these people ultimately will uh, be punished in the Akhirah for this uh, this uh, rebelliousness against the truth but there's also sort of a, a counterpoint in this ayah my dear sisters in terms of how we can understand it and that the counterpoint here is that we as Muslims as believers should be cautious least we treat the Quran as a ceremonial text that we only reach for that book when there is an occasion right someone uh, gets married or someone passes away and then we reach for the Quran as a ceremonial text and we need to be very very careful because when we treat the Quran as a ceremonial text as opposed to a book a repository of divine guidance whose meanings we should be accessing on a daily basis we actually run the risk of behaving like these people about whom the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will actually beseech Allah Ta'ala on the Day of Judgment. So we want to make sure that we are not, through our neglect, casting aside the Qur'an or casting aside opportunities to study the Qur'an. All of us, for example, should endeavor to read the Qur'an, to learn the Qur'an with tajweed, to study its commentary, asbab and nuzul, occasions of revelation. Whatever we can do, my dear sisters, to enhance our relationship with the noble book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in that regard, I want to convey a few points that I think are helpful. Practically speaking, this is the practical part, in enhancing our relationship with the Qur'an and understanding how the Qur'an interacts with the human heart, the heart that is receptive to these uh, understandings. So this, com this comes from Ilm al-Tafsir. And I'm going to introduce a few points here. So in the early days of the community, i.e. in the days of as salaf al-Salih, i.e. our righteous predecessors, and this is the age of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Sahaba tended to use the terms tafsir and ta'wil interchangeably. And this was the very first Qur'anic science as they sought to understand the meanings of the ayahs of the Qur'an so that they could do what? Put the ayahs into practice because again, their hearts, right? The Qur'an is directly interacting with their hearts and, 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 and increasing them in understanding because of the sincerity of this earliest generation of believers as awwalun as Allah Ta'ala praised them in the Qur'an. So, initially the terms were used interchangeably and uh, we have the example of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam making dua for Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma uh, that Allahumma alimhu ta'wil that, that uh, oh Allah, teach him understanding of the Qur'an. So ta'wil meant to actually go back to, it comes from the same root as awwal, which means first or origins. It actually meant to, to go to the origins of the meaning, the meanings of the words uh, in the Qur'an. Now, in books of tafsir, you might see that ta'wil is also understood as the Qur'anic science of trying to interpret the Qur'an or the ayahs of the Qur'an that are maybe more figurative. But... Linguistically, it actually means that you want to understand the origin of what's in the Qur'an. And then tafsir, uh, from the idea of fassiru, is to explain, elaborate. This is a Qur'anic exegesis or commentary, and the person who engages in that is the mufassir. 
So, my dear sisters, this is a very lofty way of accessing the Quran because it's a very, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a discipline that has its methodology and that requires a lot of training. And there are prerequisites here. However, the point that I want to emphasize, my dear sisters, is that even though the vast majority of us will not become mufassirin or mufassirat, we will not become commentators officially of the Quran, that these are amazing references for us to be accessing because the Quran is going to interact in the heart in multiple ways, many different dimensions, through its orality, through its recitation, through learning it, through reflecting on it, and through studying it, such as through tafsir. But the beginning, if you, if you, if you will, my dear sisters, the origins of tafsir go back to tadabbur and tadakkur. And by the way, if you're looking for a good resource this Ramadan, uh, the, uh, the scholar, the British Muslim scholar, Khurram Murad, uh, has a wonderful little book called Way to the Qur'an, in which he uh, presented his methodology of engaging in tadabbur. So, let's go back to that slide. Remember, Allah Ta'ala says, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ أَمْ عَلَىٰ قُلُبْنَ أَقْفَالُهَا Will they not then ponder the Qur'an, or are there locks upon their hearts? So there are a number of uh, exhortations in the Qur'an to engage in tadabbur. And this avenue, my dear sisters, is open to everyone. It does not require any particular level of expertise, but there is one prerequisite. And that is, إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَ اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ As Allah Ta'ala tells us in Surah Al-Shu'ara, uh, and the previous ayah is, on the day when neither wealth uh, nor nor children will avail one except the one that comes before Allah with a sound and a pure or purified heart. So this is the only really prerequisite. It's the heart that's receptive. It's the heart that is humble. It is the realization that we as human beings are very limited in our faculties. And that's why I started with my point about aql. Islam is not anti-intellectual, not at all. You know, historically speaking, Islam as a faith tradition was far more receptive to science, for example, than some other uh, than some other of the other religions out there. What I want to really emphasize, though, my dear sisters, is that some of the quote unquote most intelligent people in our day and age are people that deny the existence of God. They deny the reality of Scripture. They are engaged in activities that are so destructive to humanity. Look, for example, at the situation in Gaza, my dear sisters. The armaments that are used by the state of Israel that are, billah, that are furnished and funded by the United States are the result of the work of people who are educated, people who ostensibly have aql, scientists, researchers, engineers. So we have to understand, my dear sisters, that aql on its, on its own is insufficient for actually being able to, 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 to access the truth unless the aql is sound because the heart is sound. So again, the prerequisite, my dear sisters, for engaging in tadabbur is that heart that is receptive. So tadabbur consists also of something else. It consists of tafakkur, which is thought and contemplation, which I didn't mention that here, and, and also tadakkur. Tadakkur is being able to take advice. It is paying heed. It is receiving admonition and acting on that. And this was, you know, th these were the values of the Sahaba, that they took everything in the Qur'an to heart. Hence, they tended to only learn the Qur'an in increments of five to ten ayahs, because again, they wanted to apply what they were learning. So tadabbur is tafakkur, it is thought and contemplation, tadakkur, receiving admonition, and, tadab, and, and then the actual tadab, tadabbur itself comes from the idea of where you want to reach the full meaning of every word and ayah and surah in the Qur'an. It's a very holistic way of engaging with the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and it does not require any particular level of training, my dear sisters. Now, I want to wrap up by mentioning a couple points, bi-ithnillahi ta'ala, because we are in the month of Ramadan. And so I have this line of poetry here. So, أَمَا تَدَبَّرْتَ مَا فِيهِ مِنْ لَطِيفِ عِتَابِ إِنْ كُنْتَ تَزْعَمْ حُبِّي فَلِمَا هَجَرْتَ كِتَابِ 
So what this means is that what the poet here is saying, and please forgive me that I don't know the author of this. I had it written down and then I don't have those notes. So I'll have to find this for you, inshallah. But what the author of, of the, the, this poem is saying is that have you not stopped to reflect and to ponder up, uh, on what is in the Quran from my gentle reminders and admonitions to humanity? That you, O oh reader of the book, if you really claim to love me, i.e. God, then why have you left and abandoned reading my book? So as we wrap this up, I want us to all consider what is our relationship to the Qur'an today? How much of a culture do we have? And I apologize, it says American Muslims. I am based in the United States, so I need to correct that because, mashallah, this is an international audience. So I should say, how much of our culture as Muslims in the West is influenced by the Qur'an? And the reason why I say that is because one of the beautiful things, many beautiful things about the Muslim Ummah globally, and especially in the historic Muslim world, is that even when the society has become more modern or secular, that we still find a culture of Qur'an because those values are so deeply embedded in that society. So we need to make sure that we're not in danger of abandoning that book, that we don't treat it as a curious historical artifact, but we treat it as a book of beautiful, uh, uh, nourishing day-to-day -day guidance. Last but not least, I want uh, to end with this reminder, especially for those that maybe struggle with learning the Qur'an or the pronunciation or the tajweed, the rules of recitation and so on. And let's actually, uh, let me see here if I have the, this is it right here, yes. عَنَّ عَبْدِ اللَّهِ بْنِ مَسْعُودِ رَضِي اللَّهُ تَعَلَى عَنْهُ قَالْ قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ مَنْ قَرَأَ حَرْفَ مِنْ كِتَابِ اللَّهِ فَلَهُ بِهِ حَسَنَةً والحسنة بعشر أمثالها لا أقول ألف لا ميم حرف ولكن ألف حرف ولا حرف وميم حرف. So what does this mean, my dear sisters? عبد الله بن مسعود رضي الله تعالى عنه who was one of the best of the قراء of the Quran, best of the reciters and memorizers, said that the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم said, whoever recites a letter from the Book of Allah, he will receive one good deed. As ten good deeds like it, I do not say that alif la mim, i.e., comp uh, com compiled uh, or composed together, is one letter, but rather alif on its own is a letter, lam on its own is a letter, and mim is a letter. So you do the math and you see how much the hasanat of reading the Quran, how much that becomes multiplied for you. So with this uh, reminder, my dear sisters, um, I say that anything. Um, you know, anything uh, uh, beneficial that I shared is from Allah Ta'ala. The mistakes are entirely my own. I ask Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala to allow the Qur'an to be Rabi'a Qulubina, to be the spring of our hearts in every season. May Allah Ta'ala allow us to attain our Ramadan goals and beyond. And may Allah Ta'ala allow us to experience many more uh, Ramadans. I ask Allah Ta'ala to accept our recitation, our fasting, our standing at night in worship, our sadaqah, all of our good deeds during this month. I ask Allah Ta'ala to confer uh, mercy and forgiveness and al-atiq min al-nar, salvation from the fire upon all of us and our loved ones. I ask Allah Ta'ala to bless the Jannah Institute team, Shaykha, uh, Dr. Shaykha Haifa, um, and all of the amazing team, the students, the supporters, the community. Uh, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless all of you all who are watching this and your loved ones to bless all of you all with happiness and peace and safety and, and long life. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during this extremely difficult time of tribulation for our beloved brothers and sisters in Palestine, Ya Allah, please come to their aid. Ya Allah, please bestow upon them victory. Ya Allah, please end the oppression of Zionism. Ya Allah, please free Al-Quds and Al-Aqsa Ya Rabbi, in our lifetime. So uh, I am grateful to have this opportunity to reflect upon the Qur'an. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi. Wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala barakatuh.